Hello, everyone. Welcome to our January Purdue Extension Small Ruminant Lunch and Learn webinar. I'm your host, Sarah Jemanski, and today I have with me Robbie Kelly. Robbie, would you, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Welcome, everyone. Uh, super excited to see as many people in our attendee list today. Uh, I'm Robbie Kelly, and I work in Elkhart County, which is in the very northern part of Indiana. Um, and I have an interest in this topic. Um, personally, my wife and I raise boar goats, so and I've done that for a very long time. So some of the things I'll bring you are part of my expertise and, and practical things that I do as well. And for those who are not familiar with my background, I have been raising and showing registered dairy goats since 1999. And a lot of my master's work at Fort Valley State University was involved in small ruminant nutrition. But I have a lot of experience with lambing and kidding, and so we'll go ahead and get into the presentation. So the awesome. first thing that, yeah. So do you want to go ahead and take it from here, Robbie? Sure. So um, the, the first part we're going to talk about is uh, being prepared in, in the barn and uh, you know, most of us are kidding and laming in a barn, especially if it's this time of year um, or even in the in the spring or in the fall. Um, and so barn preparation is of the utmost importance. Uh, it really doesn't take a lot of time um, if you've done it for a while. And I know if you're just starting out, it can be overwhelming. But hopefully some of the things we're going to go through will, will help make that easier for all of you. So one of the things that I like to do, uh, and I preach this a lot, is barn safety. Uh, it is the easiest thing that we can do um, to prevent a, a lot of different things happening and also make your life simpler um, if uh, when you're in the middle of season, um, because that can be stressful. Um, no matter if it's a, things are going completely right, it's still stressful. Um, so... Uh, just some things on here, um, you know, they're common, but can be very easily prevented. Uh, the number one thing I talk about is extension cords, um, especially if you've got heat lamps and those things. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but the big thing, you know, keeping them out of the way, the animals, uh, keeping your eye away clear of everything. As you see in the picture here, um, this was the this is the kidding room that I have built in our barn. Um, this was prior to being used for goats. That's why it looks so clean. Um, but, you know, keeping those aisleways clear and things out of the way so you can walk through easily, um, you know, picking up after yourself is really important. Uh, hay mangers and feeders, um, I actually, uh, we have those hanging on, on the gates, um, but they're also attached. We screw them in so that uh, they don't fall anywhere. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, the sheep or goats will like to rub against them and, and knock them over. And, you know, you don't want those falling in the in the middle of the pen or those kinds of things. Um, big thing is making sure your feed's properly stored, um, whether you have a box or some um, way to keep that fresh for the animals, as well as keeping uh, rodents and, you know, raccoons that tend, uh, sometimes appear in the barn. Uh, so keeping them out of your feed. Um, one of the things that, especially here in Northern Indiana, uh, as well as even in Southern Indiana and other parts of the country, um, it does get below freezing. And so some people may use heated buckets, uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, I highly suggest using what they, uh, there's um, different companies make them. It's a thermo cube that kind of gauges the temperature uh, and will only kick on it if it's below freezing. Uh, so that's one way to kind of help prevent a fire just in case that cord was to, you know, be in the way or those kinds of things, uh, just something to easily do. And then heat lamps. Um, I personally don't like to use heat lamps unless they're absolutely necessary uh, if you're in a really cold environment. Um, the big thing, you know, when you have your barns, just making sure they're draft free, um, you know, Baby animals can withstand a lot of cold, uh, but sometimes we do have to use heat lamps. Um, these are unfortunately one of the number one sources for barn fires a lot of times in the winter. Uh, and we see that a lot, you know, occasionally there's one or every year I can almost count on one or two uh, in our area. And, and a lot of times it goes back to heat lamps. And so there's easier ways to uh, help prevent that. Um, then again, just doing that walkthrough check. But making sure you get heat lamps, um, 
that have a, a safety built into them um, that look for brands that, you know, if, if they were to fall, you know, is the bulb going to be exposed to the to the straw or the bedding? Uh, some of them have built in where the, the lamp is actually recessed into the into the actual device that it's in. Um, so it's more it's less of a risk. Um, making sure they hung up so that animals can't chew on the cords. That's huge. We know that animals are very curious. They love to chew on things. Um, you know, one of the things I do with our heat lamp cords is I actually have a, a piece of PVC pipe that I slip over that cord uh, just to make sure that they don't chew on it. It, it makes it a little less, um, it's more preventative there. And making sure they hang up so they can't really fall on the floor. And the other big thing that's not, I forgot to put on the slide, um, but making sure you hang it up high enough so that the dough or the U actually doesn't come in contact as directly as it would if it was hanging lower. Uh, so that also helps your risk there. Um, there's plenty of good sources out there to look for those kinds of heat lamps uh, versus what I call the old traditional style that you would buy at the local farm store. So designing your birthing pins doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, a lot of people like to use birthing pins. Uh, we personally do as well. Um, you know, it's need to be, it needs to be a safe, clean space, especially if you have uh, first time, first time moms. Um, you know, I like to let them have some individual space, uh, whether, you know, some people stay 24, 48 hours before they co-mingle them back into a bigger group. Uh, some people leave them in there for uh, a couple weeks. I don't think there's a right or wrong uh, answer, depending on your space. Uh, personally, in my barn, we've only got uh, eight kidding pins. Um, we have a lot more goats, but that's okay because at one time, that's all I need. Uh, and to give them a little bit of time to uh, to grow, warm up, uh, create that bond with the animal. Um, during cold months, it, an indoor space is best protected from wind um, and precipitation, which is really important because, uh, you know, number one key when, when they're birthing, get them dry and, and get them warm. Uh, will help them really thrive. So, um, as you see here in this picture, you can kind of see the different dividers that uh, people use. Some people use solid. Uh, I think that's best if you have animals that are a little more uh, protective of their young. Uh, they don't see the animals next to them near as much, um, or you can use open-sided as well. Uh, but making sure they're, they're big enough space uh, for, for those animals. So typically on that space, uh, what we recommend is a, a four by a four by five or up to a six by six. Uh, and you know, that's gonna depend upon the size of, of the mom, uh, the you or the or the doe that you're kidding or kidding or lambing out. Uh, you want to be able to have enough room to be able to lay down, move from side to side without touching both ends of the pin. Um, and so that that's really key for that. Uh, and if you're gonna leave them in that pin for for longer than that, you know. 48, 72 hour, and you're going to leave them in there for a month or so. You probably want them a little bigger because uh, as those kids grow, they're going to need um, bigger sizes, bigger size pens to be able to grow. Um, and one of the big keys there with that is, you know, feed and water containers should be placed where the you or doe cannot drop uh, the kids and the lamb, lambs in there when they're birthing. Um, one of the things that I actually do in our barn, uh, we have our buckets hanging up, uh, but when I know I'm thankfully home most of the time uh, when they're kidding. Or, uh, and so what I do is I actually pull that water bucket out uh, just to prevent anything. One, I don't want to have to get fresh water all the time, uh, but two, it also helps prevent them from accidentally going in there. One of the questions we often get is, you know, what kind of bedding should I use? Uh, I, I don't think there's a a best bedding for kidding or lambing. Uh, I think ultimately it needs to be clean and dry. Uh, I, there are some better choices uh, than others when it comes to uh, what you put in that pen. Uh, clean straw, I personally like the best. Um, you know, you can use a clean grassy area, especially if you're kidding in the spring, kidding or lambing in the spring, and you're outside. Um, you know, that that's a good spot as well. Um, newspapers uh, work because they are easily absorbable, and then clean old blankets. Uh, the poorer choice is sawdust, bare soil, 
Uh, and the worst of those two, I really think, are the dirty straw or manure pack. And the whole point of having that clean area for them uh, is to really, when they're giving birth, obviously, things are coming out of the inside of them, and we don't want things going back into the inside and causing infection. That's that's a really key with that. Um, one of the things I've noticed too, when we used when we've used just bare sawdust, uh, the kid, you know, if they're a day or two old, it tends to infect the kid's eyes or you know cause irritations. Uh, so we want to kind of prevent some of that. Uh, and one of the things that I do because I know sometimes people ask, you know, well, straw maybe is not as, as absorbable as some things. Uh, I actually put sawdust down and then put straw over top of it. Um, and then just kind of clean the pins daily throughout that. But most importantly, you know, having that kit, that clean, dry area, uh, it really helps prevent a lot of issues down the road. Okay, now we're going to switch over to talk about what supplies you need to have on hand for having and kidding. So you want to make sure that you have your birthing kit prepared before you go out and say, oh, she's in labor. So you want to, you don't want to be trying to get everything together when your doe or you is in labor and about to lamb her kid. So you want to go ahead and have clean towels available. I like to have two towels per, you know, the expected number I have in a litter. So if I know that I typically have you know, that triplets is about the most that I would expect, then I would have six clean towels available to me. And then if for some reason she had quadruplets, then, you know, that's still enough. But I like to have at least two per the expected litter size. And then, you know, you want to have some kind of, you know, betadine, some kind of a tinctured iodine, betadine or other disinfectant like chlorhexidine for cleaning up mom's side, you know, dipping navels, etc. So there are a lot of things that you'll use a disinfectant for. You want to have exam gloves in case for some reason you need to check mom and see how she's progressing or if she needs assistance. And in addition to that, you're going to need to have some lubricant. And so personal lubricant that you'd use for a human is okay. You, know, you can get larger quantities. You can get veterinary lubricants in a gallon, you know, a gallon jug. From, from a lot of your farm supply stores. So anything that you might use for AI is safe to use for birthing. And then a flashlight or headlamp, because they don't work around your schedule. They go when it's their schedule. And so if your barn is not well lit, you are going to want some assistance in lighting. So you know, some kind of a, a an electric lantern, a flashlight, a headlamp, some point, you know, if you're going to use a flashlight, you're going to want a helper to hold it just in case. And then it's good to talk to your veterinarian about, you know, being able to get a prescription for some injectable oxytocin just in case you have a retained placenta or stalled labor. Oxytocin is not something that you want to, you know, use, you know, to induce labor with your sheep or goats. But if you have a labor that started and stalled or if she's taking a long time passing that placenta, then it, it's something good to have on hand. And at that point, you know, you never know, you know, if she goes into labor at midnight Friday night and your veterinarian does not have weekend hours, you may not be able to get that in time if there's a retained placenta. And so having a hemostat or an umbilical clamp can be helpful, especially if you have one where you have a, a doe or you that aggressively likes to bite the umbilical cords. And so you can clamp that umbilical cord off. Now, a lot of times you won't need that, but if you have one that's bleeding from the umbilicus or you, again, you have that aggressive you or doe, then that's something that's really handy to have on hand. Puppy training pads can be useful, or again, you can use towels for this, but puppy training pads are nice to have a clean spot to put the kid when it's born. It's disposable and it's an absorbent clean surface. So that's optional, but it's kind of one of those nice to have sort of things. You also want to have some emergency supplies on hand for mom, just in case she has some problems. So ketone strips are necessary and you want to have the, you don't just want to have these for the time of lambing or kidding, but if she's showing swollen legs or, you know, some, or just kind of general difficulty, 
as she's approaching, you know, during that last part of pregnancy, then having those ketone strips on hand so you can check for ketosis is really useful. And having propylene glycol on hand, that's a treatment for ketosis. So if you have those ketone strips, she's showing signs of ketosis, you dose her with that, then that can help, that can save lives. And then nutrigen, molasses, or carrot syrup, those are things that can be useful, you know, if she's had a rough kidding and she's lost a lot of energy. They can also be useful for a kid that's slow to, that's slow to nurse if they need a little bit of a sugar boost. And then having Tums or some other source of calcium on hand, because again, when they're coming into milk, you're, you have a lot of calcium that's being pulled out of the bloodstream, out of the bones. So calcium deficiency is something that is pretty common you know, in a doe or you that has recently kitted or lambed. And then to be able to give any injections, you need to have appropriately sized syringes and needles on hand. And that's going to depend on what type of injections you might be giving. And so you'll just need to have an appropriate size needle and syringe for any potential medication you might have to give. You're also going to want to have a dosing syringe without a needle that you can use for administering oral you know, supplements or medications. And then make sure you have an emergency number for your vet. And again, an emergency number, not just the office number, but an emergency number where you can reach them after hours. Because like I said before, they're not working around your schedule. They're not working around when the vet's open. You know, chances are when you're gonna have an emergency, it's gonna be at midnight, 2 a.m. And so also have your supplies for newborn care. So you wanna have a tube feeding kit prepared for weak lambs or kids. And so that's going to consist of a large syringe and a tube that can go down the throat. And so talk to your veterinarian if you're not sure what to have in that, but be prepared to, to tube feed weak lambs or kids. So Pritchard nipples with an empty soda bottle, those, can, those are useful for you know, neonatal kids and lambs. They're a little bit easier for them to, you know, to drink off of than a standard, you know, lamb or kid nipple. And then some way to warm up cold kids, especially this time of year, if you're lambing or kidding in January, February, March, you may have situations where it's 10 degrees outside and she's lambing or kidding and you need to get these lambs or kids you know, warmed up quickly, especially if she's slow to get them dry. If they're dry, they can withstand a lot of cold weather, but if they're wet, it's a lot harder for them to regulate their body temperature. And so again, having those towels that we talked about a couple of slides ago, getting, being able to get them dry, or if you come out, she's already lambda kitted and they're cold and unresponsive. You need a way to warm them up. And then a bulb syringe, like you would use for an infant, can be useful to clear the nasal passages. And then a rectal thermometer for taking temperatures. Again, temperature is key with neonates. If they're too cold, they're gonna be unresponsive, they're not going to nurse, and you'll have a difficult time with them. So getting them up to an appropriate temperature can be important. And then having a stethoscope to be able to listen for breathing and, and heart rate if you have a weak lamb or kid. So these are all useful instruments to have just in case of problems with kidding. Okay, Robbie, you can take over here. So confirming pregnancy, that's that's where we were really going to start in this process. Uh, and we're going to kind of go through what that looks like in different ways that you can uh, use to confirm pregnancy and you're using uh, dose. So estimating due dates, uh, that's always the big question. Um, you know, there people have different management style practices and uh, I, I always kind of cringe a little bit when I see these pictures put on Facebook. They're like, when do you think my animal is due? And, you know, they, it's a picture of the rear and we've all seen it and I just kind of chuckle a little bit. Um, it, and that's, you know, no harm, no foul. But, uh, you know, for me, whether you whether you have two or three animals, or you have 50 or 100 animals, uh, you know, 
the more accurate date you can get on your animal's bread date, the more success you are going to have. Um, and I really, truly believe that. Um, you know, so we know that gestation is typically 150 days on average, uh, give or take a few days. Um, if you're like me this year, I had three or four of them. They went way past and I had, a, you know, four or five days after that 150 and I had a couple before. And, you know, thankfully, most of the time they're right at that 150, but know that they can they can really vary just a little bit. So keeping records of your breeding dates, um, you know, that's. You know, we recommend hand breeding when possible, um, or if you're turning them out in the pasture to breed, which is what we do most of the time, uh, you know, try to use a marking harness. And so as you kind of see in that picture there, once the ram has bred the you, uh, you know, as you're feeding them every night uh, or in the morning, you know, have a, have a little notebook that you write down what day you saw that, uh, and then go to the calendar and count 150 days uh, would be your typical average, is really easy to do. Um, and then you also want to keep record of when you've put that animal in and when you've removed them, um, you know, helps you clarify and short that shorten that window uh, so you can really have a different um, so that you're managing them just a little more. And that's going to be really important down the road as you're feeding it, you know, they in the first or second uh, part of their their trimesters there and, you know, where are they at in the growth of the of the babies there. And so that really helps helps plan. Uh, for those next five months. So there's different ways that you can confirm pregnancy. Um, just because an animal got marked that, you know, potentially got bred that day doesn't obviously always mean that they took. Um, so there are blood tests out there uh, that they can confirm uh, that they have been bred. Uh, there's also a really cool YouTube video that Purdue's put together on how to take blood, uh, you know, through the veins. There's urine tests available, um, but really they aren't ac as accurate until the second trimester. I've not personally used the urine test one. Uh, I've done some blood testing before. Uh, in milk tests, uh, so, you know, if you're um, more on the dairy goat side of things, uh, this works really well that you can have that sent in. Uh, to be tested to that's that's pretty accurate. So one of the one of the big things that uh, you know is an easy way with not with doing a lot of observation um, is you know that first bread date you know the early signs of pregnancy is that they're going to stop cycling. Um, so one of the things that we'll sometimes do. Uh, in our operation, because I'm, I'm turning the buck out and they're in pasture uh, most of the time, is I'm going to have my little notebook that has, you know, the dates of when I saw the first time that, you know, the, the buck showed interest in the doe. Um, and if it doesn't reappear 21 days later, okay, you know, she's probably bred. Or uh, if the buck has marked her again, you know, that's she cycled again, so she didn't take that first time. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out. Another physical sign is, you know, 60 to 90 days. Uh, sometimes you can start seeing a little bit of shapeliness in them. Um, it, you know, if they start to show the signs of early pregnancy, um, you know, some show more than others. Um, swelling of the vulva is typically a, one of the first signs and other developments, another sign. And depending on, you know, the breed and, and the species, you know, you may not see an udder till a month before. Uh, sometimes a little sooner, um, sometimes not till two weeks before, depending on uh, that particular animal. So knowing that animal as well. One of the things that I really like to use um, is uh, an ultrasound. Um, so, the, so the ultrasound um, in radiography is a, is a way to help confirm pregnancy, uh, but sometimes you can also get, and if, you're really good at this can also get the number of fetuses. Um, you know, ideally use a trans abdominal um, ultrasound machine typically is 35 to 90 days post breeding uh, for uh, goats or sorry for sheep and goats is 40 to 75 days. Um, you know, the radiography you're typically using 65, 70 days to post breeding to help confirm that pregnancy there. Um, 
and most accurately performed by either a veterinarian or a technician. Um, but there are some pretty inexpensive units that you can get that work well for on-farm use. Um, there are there's lots of models out there that range from you know a couple hundred bucks to several thousand dollars depending on. Um, I personally you know, rely on my veterinarian to come do those ultrasounds for us just to confirm. Um, and, and that really helps, you know, okay, is this doe or you bred or not? Because I personally don't want to be wasting putting more feed into this animal than I have to because we know that's a huge expense. So that ultrasound just really helps confirm that or even some of those other things that we've talked about as well. All right, Sarah. So now we're going to talk about preventing some problems. We're going to talk a little bit about animal health and how you prevent problems with giving birth. So the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we're monitoring health throughout the pregnancy. And there are some, some particular times during pregnancy where you want to go through and do specific checks of these animals. So about four to six weeks before the due date, you want to booster their vaccinations. And so CDT and then with sheep, there are additional vaccines that, that you'll use. You want to make sure you check their FAMACHA score or have a fecal test done to assess how parasitized they are, and then if needed, particularly if you're going to be lambing or kidding during, during the warm months. You do not want to use balbazin because that can cause abortions, but there are several different you know, dewormers that are safe for use during pregnancy. If you use copper bolusing as part of your management strategy, you know, if you're in a copper deficient area or if you're in air where you're using it to help you know, prevent parasites, this is a good time to administer a bolus. You also want to trim the feet. And then shortly before lambing or kidding, you want to trim any long hair that might be on their back legs or their udder that might get in the way of them finding the udder if you're dam raising. Or if you're going to be milking, you know, you want to trim away hair that might be in the way of milking. And again, you want to trim the feet again. And depending on your management strategy, you may move them to the birthing pen at this time, or you may wait a couple more days and, until you actually see symptoms. So a lot symptoms of giving birth, you know, of labor. A lot of, you know, it just kind of depends on how closely you're able to monitor these animals. So if you are working you know, 12 hour days and you know that you cannot watch these does very closely, then you want to make sure that you are moving them to that birthing pen a few days before the due date so that they can be you know, in a safe place. But if you're able to watch these animals really closely, if you're retired or, or something else, then it's fine to wait until you're actually seeing signs of labor. Another thing you might consider is you know, giving uh, BOSE if you're in a selenium deficient area, but that's one you need to talk to your veterinarian about. It's not something that everybody should necessarily be giving, but if you do know that there are pro you've had problems with, you know, with white muscle disease in the past, selenium deficiency, then BOSE can be a good thing to give, you know, a couple of weeks before lambing or kidding. So with the vaccination protocols that we mentioned, so clostridial vaccines are something we want to give to all use or does before lambing or kidding. So if these does have an unknown vaccination history or you know they haven't been vaccinated, you actually want to give two doses. So you'll give one at least, you know, at least six weeks before and then another one two to four weeks later. So six to eight weeks for the first dose and then four weeks before kidding or lambing for the second dose. If they've already been vaccinated, they just need one dose four to six weeks. Now, if you're giving a, a multivalent vaccine, such as Covexin 8, that could be two to four weeks before lambing or kidding. But if you're giving just the CDNT, that four to six weeks before lambing or kidding is what you want. Sheep also, you may want to consider some additional vaccines, such as chlamydia, which you're going to give 60 days before breeding and then revaccinate 30 days later. So this is not actually during pregnancy, it's before breeding. And chlamydia is one of the top causes of abortions. 
in use. And you might consider if you've had problems with chlamydia in goats, there are some people that I know vaccinate for chlamydia with goats. And then also, yeah, Campylobacter, bacterial pneumonia. Again, you're going to vaccinate before breeding. And then again, yeah, four weeks or 60 to 90 days later. And then with bacterial pneumonia vaccine, you'll vaccinate again two to four weeks before lambing. And so again, these are more of sheep vaccines. But if you if you want to read more details about vaccines, the source that I list below is a great resource. Another thing you want to do, and you want to do this at several points uh, through pregnancy. So you want to do it pre-breeding and you want to do it throughout pregnancy is body condition scoring. So sheep and goats are scored on a scale of one to five. Ideally, they will be at a 3.5 at the time of birthing or the time of kidding. And so when we <clears throat> and so not want to see these over a four. If they are over a four, you're at a much higher risk of ketosis or pregnancy toxemia. You do not, you also do not want to see them below a three. Once you, so at low body condition scores and at high body condition scores, you are at much higher risk of problems during lambing and kidding than you are if you're between a three and a four at the time of lambing or kidding. So again, ideally we want to be at a three and a half, but it may not be possible to get every animal to three and a half. But if we're somewhere between a three and a four, we should be pretty safe as far as body condition goes for lambing or kidding. And so this is an illustration of the different scores. So at a one, you have an emaciated animal. You're going to, the spine is going to be very sharp. There's not going to be a lot of back muscle. At the opposite extreme, at a five, you cannot feel the spine. There's just very thick fat deposits all over the animal. And you'll have fat deposits over the tail and the rump. And so we want to be in between the extremes. You want to be able to feel the spine. You want to have full back muscle. You want to have some fat cover. But you don't want to have excessive amounts of fat. And so here are some photos. And these are actually boa or boa type does. So if you're looking at, if you clip the hair off, some animals can be deceptive because they're hairy and they may not look as thin as they actually are. But in the case of this animal, you can see very prominent spine, very prominent ribs. You can see there's not a lot of muscling over the top line. Now, with dairy animals, you may have animals that are in the three range where you still have a fairly prominent spine. But if you feel them, you can feel that that muscle cover. It just has it just has to do with with the structure, the bone structure of the animal. Similarly to the differences between dairy cattle and beef cattle. And so you will see more prominent bones in a dairy animal than you will in a meat animal. But you need to look at how much cover is there. Is there the musculature that you want to see? And you do see lighter muscle in general on dairy animals you know, compared to meat animals. But if you look at the, the depth in the barrel, you know, for instance, like at a body condition score of one, there will be no depth to that barrel. At a body condition score of two, you'll start to see some depth to the barrel, but you won't see a lot of muscle, muscle mass or fat cover. And then once you get to a three, that's where you, you know, have adequate muscle mass and adequate fat cover. But you want a little extra at the time of lambing your kidding. That's why we say three and a half, because we want them to have some reserves as they're coming into milk. Because these does and use are going to be going into what we call a negative energy balance as they come into lactation. They will be putting out more energy in lactation than they will be able to take in in their diet. So we want, we want them to have a little extra at the time of lambing or kidding, but we don't want them to be obese. And so as we look at this five, this is an animal that it may even, you know, you may even have dimples on the animal with the amount of fat, just because the fat goes over the, the skeletal structure. And so this is what we do not want to see. So again, that three to four is where we want to be at the time of laying or kidding. We don't want to be a two or below. We don't want to be a five. 
So some other problems that we can see during pregnancy. So vaginal prolapse is often, you know, often genetic. So it usually happens in the third trimester and is more common in sheep than goats. And so the causes, you have the intra-abdominal pressure. So inside the abdomen, you have a lot of pressure due to the increased size of the uterus, especially if you have multiple lambs or kids. And then you also have, if you have a very fat animal, then that can cause more pressure as well because there's just not as much room in that abdomen. You also have the you know, relaxation and softening of the pelvic girdle that's caused by the pregnancy hormones. And so that makes it a little bit easier to happen. But again, some of it's genetic, some of it is due to having animals that are, you know, obese. Or, you know, potentially the tail could be docked too short and that can cause some problems. You know, that can make them more, more susceptible to prolapse. And so the treatment, if you do have a vaginal prolapse, is you wanna use a local anesthetic, you wanna wash the prolapse organ, you wanna replace and suture it. That suture will have to be removed before they give birth. Or you may use a prolapse retainer instead of, you may suture that in rather than actually suturing the, the vulva. <clears throat> but again, this, you know, but once this you, most likely you, or doe, lambs or kids, this is not one you wanna keep in your herd or flock. So you, you, know, you get the kids or the lambs out of her, but especially if it's genetic, it's not something you wanna keep in your genetic pool. Pregnancy toxemia and ketosis are very common in overweight animals, particularly. You can see it in severely underweight animals as well. You usually see it with user does that have multiples more than two feeding, feed eye. So if you have triplets, quadruplets, that's when you're most likely to see this. And in my personal experience, you're more likely to see it if they're carrying males than if they're carrying female fetuses. And so the early symptoms you'll see is they're going to be off feed, they're going to be lethargic, and you're going to see edema in the front legs. And so, you know, part of it is, you know, if they're carrying triplets or quadruplets, they just don't have a whole lot of room in there for feed. And if they have ketosis going on, they're not going to feel hungry. And again, the lethargy. So this is where those ketone strips are, are handy. You want to make sure that they have a high quality feed so that they're not going into ketosis. So ketosis happens when they don't have enough energy in their diet. And so they're burning fat to take that, you know, to create energy. So the ketones, they're using those ketones, but this is causing some problems, you know, metabolically for them. And so, you know, there are similar symptoms that you can see with milk fever or calcium deficiency. And so if they don't respond to calcium treatment and you're, or you're seeing the ketone strips showing that they, there are a lot of ketones in the urine, you want to, you know, dose with propylene glycol multiple times a day. And you want to go ahead and induce delivery because if you don't induce delivery, there's a good chance you might lose the still or you. But again, it's really important to monitor your does and ewes in late pregnancy to ensure that they're eating. Because if you catch this early, you can save them. If you, if you can't catch this early enough, then, then there's a good you're going to lose that ewe or doe. And so it's really important to, to monitor them in late pregnancy, particularly if they're overweight or severely malnourished. And then we have the milk fever calcium deficiency that has very similar symptoms. And again, it typically occurs during the last few weeks of gestation. It's most common when you have multiple fetuses. This is caused by low serum calcium and high calcium demand. So these multiple fetuses, the bones are growing really quickly at, in late pregnancy. And so they're pulling a lot of calcium out of the mother's bloodstream. And if she cannot replace that calcium either through from her bones or through her diet, then she can go into this milk fever. 
So she'll have those very similar symptoms to what we described before. So you want to make sure that she has calcium rich foods in her diet and that she's eating. And so you want to make sure that there's adequate calcium in the diet. Sometimes though, it can help to actually reduce dietary calcium to a little bit earlier so that they pull calcium from their bones. But the key is this is serum calcium. You need to make sure that you have enough calcium in her blood serum to be able to meet the demands of both these growing fetuses and the beginnings of milk production. So if you do see symptoms and you treat with, with calcium, with intravenous calcium, that will, you'll see almost instant recovery. And so the question is, should you induce? So premature births you know, tend to lead to less than ideal outcomes for the lambs or kids. And so ideally, you don't want to induce before 144 days post-breeding. And that's because you, those kids or those lambs need to have that lung development. Because you know, unless you want to spend a lot of money with your veterinarian, for treatment of preemies, which, and, not, and most veterinarians aren't set up for treatment of preemies, you don't have a lot of use for goats and sheep, then you, you really don't want to induce unless you have to, you know, before day 150. But if it's been at least 144 days since the breeding date, and you're seeing signs of pregnancy toxemia or ketosis, or, Maybe you have an overweight doe and you're anticipating problems and you want to make sure you're present. And it's been that 144 days, then it's okay to induce. Another reason you might consider inducing is if it's been more than 155 days since breeding and you're concerned about the size of the kid or the health of the doe. And so a lot of times if you have a doe or a ewe that's carrying a single, they can go late and they can be very large. I've had 16 pound kids born before that were 156, 157 days. You do not want to induce if it's been less than 144 days since breeding and the doe or you is not in distress. Or you don't have an exact breeding date and she's not in distress. Now, if she's in distress, then that changes your calculation. If it's a, if it's a choice of save the doe or lose them all, then you know, you would induce to save the doe or the ewe. But otherwise, you know, you want to have those really good records. You want to have those breeding dates. You want to know when she's due if you're making those decisions on induction. And so we have several different resources, you know, for more information. And there is a PDF version of this presentation that's in the Google Drive. And you will receive an email you know, after this program with the link to that Google Drive and also a link to a survey. We really appreciate you filling out the survey, letting us know what you learned and what you'd like to see in future presentations. And now we'll go to your questions. And so I know there are a number of questions in the chat box. Okay, so first question is for Robbie. You said that lambs and kids can handle a lot of cold. I agree, but do you have a rough rule of thumb for what's too cold, assuming a dry lamb or kid? So that I think that's a great question. Um, it, it really depends uh, on your setup, I think, partially. Um, if you have a draft-free facility that you can keep them in, um, you know, I checked our outside of our barn this morning in the main part because I have a room built in my barn that's actually insulated. It's not heated, it's just insulated. Um, the outside of my barn was like 25 degrees. Um, you know, if they're a couple weeks old, that's okay um, because I have a little box in there that they can get into um, with a heat lamp um, is what my setup would be. There's none in there at the moment. Um, but in that insulated room, uh, it really averages about 40 degrees they could go down to 20, 25 degrees as long as it's draft free and they're completely dry would be my kind of my touch point. 
Um, you know, as long as the kids have a place to get in, if they're younger, you know, they're less than a couple of weeks old that they can get in. It's a little warmer for them. We have a comment from a listener. I use cane heat mats. They work so well and no fire hazard. I place them inside a Rubbermaid tote, turn on its side, and hold through the back of the tote for the cord to go through. So the cord is behind the tote. Yeah, and I think that's good too, as long as, you know, as long as they can't chew on it and there, you know, there's lots of different ways that way that you can do that. And, uh, sometimes with really cold uh, kids that you've just discovered, they get really cold. Um, I'll throw a bunch of towels in the dryer and warm them up for 10 or 15 minutes and then wrap the kids in there too, to keep them warm. Okay, and then there was a question on the hoof trimming. So for trimming, is it okay to put ewes on their rumps for hoof trimming this close to pregnancy, or I guess to, to giving birth? Or is a hoof trimming only okay if they're standing on a hoof trimming stand? I think that's probably going to depend on the ewe and whether or not she's going to struggle. I don't see any problems necessarily with putting them on their rumps, but again, <clears throat> it'll depend on your comfort in holding her and her comfort in being on her rump. And so I think it's going to be very much dependent on the, the individual. You don't want to stress her. Is she going to be stressed or not is the big question. So you might be better off doing it on a, a trimming stand if you are concerned that putting them on the rump is going to stress them. You just want to keep the stress levels as low as you can during late pregnancy. And how far ahead of lambing should wool sheep be sheared? A lot of that's probably going to depend on your climate and where you are. So you do want, you, know, you don't want to have a long wool coat on a, a ewe that's just about to lamb, you know, to lamb because for sanitary reasons. And so depending on your climate, depending on the temperatures, it may depend on whether or not you shear the entire ewe or whether you're just going to shear the, the hind end. You know, ideally the closer to lambing, the better as far as cleanliness goes. But again, you have to consider your climate and temperatures and whether or not you're going to shear the entire animal. Is it okay to vaccinate ewes with CDT two to three weeks before the lambing? So it's, you're going to have to look at the label of the products that you're using. Some vaccines are labeled for you know, up to two weeks before lambing or kidding. Others are labeled four to six weeks. And so with CDNT, you want to, if it's just the CDNT, in most cases, you want to do that four to six weeks. But if you're using something like Covexin 8 or another multivalent, then you could probably do it two to three weeks before lambing. Okay, so earlier you mentioned selenium deficiency in a product called Bose. Okay, so it's actually B-O-S-E. So it's for, it's vitamin E and selenium for those that were asking about that product. So it's an injectable vitamin E and selenium. And we have a comment from someone else. We lay them outside below zero temps with their nine hours of brown fat they can do fine. For sure, goats cannot tolerate this. Draft-free barns, they have no brown fat. So yeah, so again, it's gonna depend on your species, your breed, and there's just a lot, there are some differences between sheep and goats. Okay, so asking about saving the slides. So there is a Google Drive link. You will receive an email from WebEx, follow, a follow-up email. It's going to have a link to the Google Drive. And if you look in the lambing and kidding folder, there will be a copy of these slides in there. And so you will be able to go back and use this information. This is also being recorded and it will be posted to YouTube tomorrow. Okay, question. I'm a little worried my ewes are above a body score of four. We've never had this before and they've just been on grass this fall and a grass slash alfalfa hay this winter, plus a small amount of oats. I'm two to four weeks out from <clears throat> lambing. Should I adjust anything at this point? I would probably not do too much maybe if anything mon you know monitor them closely two to four weeks out from lambing i probably wouldn't make a lot of changes 
you can increase the the protein a little bit if <clears throat> but there's a you have to balance the increase in protein because that can also increase the lamb or kid size. But increasing protein can help suppress problems with parasites. But I wouldn't make a lot of changes in the diet, you know, very, very late in gestation. So a question, do we have a similar presentation on the actual day of delivery? That's a great question. That's what we're going to be talking about next month. So we're going to go through lambing and kidding next month. I'll go ahead and go to, to our next slide. So what you want to do, tune in on February 25th for managing use and dose during lambing and kidding. And we'd also encourage you to register for our controlling weeds and pastures virtual field day that is going to be taught by our forage specialist, Keith Johnson and others. And so the information for there, you're going to register online at www.purdueag.tv. It's a free workshop, you know, a free field day online. So you can join from anywhere. So do we have additional questions about lambing or kidding? Sarah, there are some in the in the questions down here. Okay. Um, so one person asked about uh, rules for moving pregnant animals in late gestation. I uh, just found out they're moving one you uh, one you should be um, before the move, but the other two are uh, about four weeks away. Um, I would say you can do it as in the least amount of stress as possible. Um, you know, easy loading, um, moving them around. Um, you know, we share herd of goats with our in-laws um, and they're only 15 minutes down the road, so it's not a far travel. Um, and, and we'll move them in two weeks before um, they they kid. And so, you know, as long as you're careful, you're not going across country or, you know, super far. Um, you know, I've shown does a month and a half before they're due. Um, Obviously, the least amount of stress as possible is key with that uh, would be my recommendation. Uh, the next one uh, asks about um, what do you consider a high quality feed during pregnancy and lactation uh, protein or energy percentages? What do you personally use or recommend? Um, so I, it's going to depend on species here uh, a little bit. And then, you know, age of that animal, whether it's a three or four year old or a little younger um and so right now i'm just feeding a simple grain mix um with pretty much free choice hay uh, i primarily a grass type hay um, but again i have boar boar goats so um, i'm not as worried about milk production um and we're using a 14 percent protein uh, making sure it's balanced with a nutritionist and, and i'm sure there it's a little different on the dairy end so i can let sarah chime in on that Sure. On the dairy end, I'm, I actually cut back the alfalfa during gestation because, you know, it's time that I'm dry. When I dry them off, I'm going to cut back on alfalfa. I'll still feed some alfalfa, but not, but it'll typically be more grass hay and less alfalfa. And then I will keep them on their, their normal ration, but I'll reduce the, the amount of it. So if, if we're talking about a 16% dairy ration, so if you're looking at say maybe three pounds per just a dough that would eat three pounds per head per day on, during lactation she might eat one pound per day during pregnancy so we're so i'm reducing the amount of concentrate free choice hay but most of that's going to be grass hay with just a little bit of alfalfa to increase the, the protein there but it's going to be mostly you know mostly grass hay and limited concentrate start increasing that alfalfa as we get a little closer to to kidding but not by a lot. I don't like to feed pure alfalfa going into lamb or kidding because it, kid size. You know, if you feed too much protein during late gestation when these kids are just growing so quickly, then you can end up with kids that may be too large for them to have easily. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So one of the next questions is um, for does for any reason that would not have milk or colostrum at the time of birth, 
what do you recommend as a colostrum replacer or frozen colostrum from a goat? I think that's a great question, um, especially if you're just starting out. One of the things that, you know, this year what I would do, um, you know, if you've had one that maybe kitted earlier or lambed earlier, um, I will actually, after about 12 hours, go and milk a little bit out of a doe um, that has maybe only had a single or had twins who happens to be a high produced milker. Um, I'll milk them out just a little bit and freeze them in ice cube trays um, and save that supply for next year or this year if I absolutely need it. Um, it that's the best alternative uh, to the mom's milk, um, it, at least in my perspective. Colostrum replacer can work in a pinch. I just personally don't really like to use it because uh, I don't think it's as high quality. Well, one thing to consider, though, if you're going to use, you know, colostrum is biosecurity. So you want to make sure that if you're sourcing your colostrum from someone other than your own herd, that you that they've been tested for the diseases that concern you, particularly things such as, yeah, you know, CAE or OPP if you're if you're talking about sheep and things, you know, you might want to. You might want to make sure they're tested for yonis and potentially other diseases. So I would be very cautious using colostrum from another herd. Maybe consider heat treating that colostrum. You can find directions for heat treating it at various resources. But that's some, but don't just use colostrum from anywhere. You want to make sure if you're going to use colostrum, make that you're taking biosecurity into account. And if you do not have a source of colostrum where, that you can verify comes from a herd that's tested, then you are probably better off using a colostrum replacer. Yep, great point. Uh, so one of the last ones I see in our Q&A box here, Sarah, uh, is I am lambing in the northern, in the north under extreme cold conditions. I use a heat box to warm and dry off lambs. What's a good temperature a heat box to prevent overheating of them should be? You want your heat box to be about body temperature. So, you know, body temperature for a for a goat is going to be 101 to 103. So you don't want to get above that body temperature in your heat box. Awesome. So. That's all I see in the Q&A, but it looks like there's something else in the yeah, I'm seeing a few more in the Q&A. You know, so what are thermal requirements for goats, adults, slash kids? So that's going to depend a lot on a how yeah you know, how much shelter do they have? Like they can they can tolerate pretty low temperatures if they have a windbreak and they have bedding. And even if we're talking about adults, you know. They, they'll do pretty well in pretty cold environments as long as they have a way to warm themselves up through you know, getting together, through burrowing in straw, et cetera. Yeah, kids, if you get, again, it depends on whether they're dry or not. You know, once you get below about 20 degrees, you know, especially, so if you have a dam raised kid, they can tolerate colder temperatures than a bottle raised kid, simply because they have their dam there for heat. And so a lot of it's going to be dependent on your situation. And so a lot of it is monitoring them closely. If they appear to be shivering, you know, then you might need to adjust something. And another question. I have a, an old horse barn with large stalls. Are there any issues with too big a stall? Is it ever okay to have used sheer large stalls for birthing? That's a, a good question. I think that's kind of up to personal preference in um, you know, there's some of the ones that I've done where, you know, I'll put two or three goats in a, in a larger pen, um, you know, as first of all, as long as they're not, as long as they get along, um, cause we all know that there's always the dominant one or two in the herd that likes to pick on everyone else. Um, just really making sure they're friendly with each other. Um, I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, but I would be prepared to have a space to maybe you know, put up a temporary gate or something if you have to. Um, and then also sometimes you got to watch for, I call them baby snatchers, um, like to, uh, you know, they might go nurse on another mom, make sure that's, you know, just so just watch out for those few things when you when you do co-mingle them. 
Um, but I, I think you're okay to do that. And I, I did hear somebody yesterday express disbelief at somebody that she had sold some goats with that they had to DNA test them, not just for the sire, but they also didn't know who the dam was. So that's a risk in commingling does or ewes at the time of birth is they may switch lambs or kids. And so if it's if pedigree is important to you, you might want to have them in individual pens. But it just kind of depends on what your goals are. I did see another question, more and more popping up in there. Um, so it asked, what is the harm in uh, doing hands off, laming and kidding? Uh, those that are no vaccine breeders, just new to this, and I'm curious to find out many options. One of my things is, you know, I'm pretty hands off. I try to let them kid naturally um, on their own, just paying attention and watching them uh, is my ultimate goal. Um, you know, so, I'll, but if they're struggling, I want to be down there. Uh, this year, unfortunately, I've had to pull several kids. Um, and so that sometimes happens. Um, you know, I think the more hands off as far as just watching them, uh, observing the signs, and if there is something that needs to, if you need to intervene, then intervene uh, is kind of what my philosophy is. Right. It depends on your management strategy and your management philosophy. It's perfectly fine for them, particularly for hair sheep, to lamb out in the pasture. But if you're not if you're not monitoring them well, then you may end up with you know you losses, lamb losses. And so, what is your loss tolerance? And also, what is humane? Like, at what point do you need to intervene? How closely are you going to monitor these animals that are out in the field? And a lot of your hair do just fine in the middle of winter landing out in the field. And so it's more how closely are you able to monitor these animals and see if there is distress and intervene if absolutely necessary. But a hands off approach can be just fine, but you will have more lamb losses most likely than you would if you have a little bit more hands on approach. But if, if that's okay with your management strategy and with your, you know, if you are trying to breed for these hardier sheep, there are people who do that. And so just kind of consider what's most humane for your herd or flock. There was a question, is maple syrup able to substitute for molasses? I have maple syrup, so I have more of that ready, readily available. Yes, it, it could substitute. The thing is you, you need a ready source of a sugar if you have a dough or you that is is hypoglycemic or a kid or lamb is hypoglycemic. And so yes, that that would be a good source of sugar that could address a hypoglycemic lamb or kid. And then there were a couple of dairy goat questions. I plan to bottle feed dairy goat kids. How long do I keep the mother in a birthing pen after kidding? It really depends on your management strategy and how friendly she is. What I would do is keep her there until you know, she's recovered. So she's physically recovered, and I'd probably keep her there until she has, until her milk comes in and she's trained to the milk stand. And yeah, maybe if, if she's really friendly, then she doesn't need to be in there very long. She'll just come out to the milk stand immediately and you don't need to worry about it. And then I just leave her in there until she's fully recovered. But if you have one that was maybe dam raised, you're changing strategy, but she was dam raised, she's a little bit wild. I'd probably keep her in there until you can put your hands on her, you can catch her out in the pasture. And then how much should a Nubian dairy goat be eating one month before to shortly after birth? Currently getting grass hand alfalfa and one pound of grain a day. So that's gonna depend on her body condition score. That sounds like an appropriate ration, you know, assuming that the hay is free choice, but it will depend on that individual animal and that individual animal's metabolism. So if she's in that range of a body condition score of three to four, that's probably appropriate. If she's a little on the thin side, you might increase the grain a little bit. If she's on the fat side, you might reduce the grain a little bit. But that free choice hay is really helpful. And so for, if you want to rewatch this or you have a friend that missed it, this will be posted to YouTube tomorrow. And so the link to my YouTube channel will be in that email that you receive.